بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم Welcome back to season 1 of the Umayyad Caliphate presented by Islamic History Exclusive. I'm your host, Mutaki Ismail, and this is episode 1-6, The History of Al-Aqsa. Let's begin by discussing Al-Haram al-Sharif or the Noble Sanctuary in Jerusalem. Al-Haram al-Sharif, which is also called Al-Aqsa or Masjid Al-Aqsa, was the first Qibla in Islam before Allah commanded us to pray towards the Kaaba in Mecca. Al-Aqsa, or Al-Haram al-Sharif, the Noble Sanctuary, is a large rectangular-shaped compound located in the southeast corner of the old city of Jerusalem. Al-Aqsa covers about 35 acres of land and contains several religious monuments and artifacts which we will discuss later on in this episode. The two most prominent of these religious monuments and buildings are Masjid Al-Qibli, which most of us consider Masjid Al-Aqsa, and the Dome of the Rock, which in Arabic is Qubatul Sahra. Masjid Al-Aqsa, or Al-Haram al-Sharif, the Noble Sanctuary, is the third holiest site in Islam after the Kaaba and Masjid al-Nabawi in Medina. Within this compound, all of which is sacred, are at least 200 historical and religious monuments and artifacts. And just like the Haram in Mecca, and the Prophet's Masjid in Medina, the entire compound of Al-Aqsa is blessed and sacred. The prayer can be made any place within Al-Aqsa, within Masjid Al-Aqsa, and not just within its buildings, such as the Dome of the Rock or Masjid Al-Qibli, which most of us call Masjid Al-Aqsa. And this is the thing I want to make sure we understand. The entire compound, the entire 35 acres that is known as Al-Aqsa, that is known as Masjid Al-Aqsa, which is also known as Al-Haram al-Sharif, which is also known as the Noble Sanctuary, all of this is Masjid Al-Aqsa. Not just the building that we colloquially call Masjid Al-Aqsa, which is probably prefer to be called Masjid al-Qibli. And I'll explain that later on. So you can pray anywhere within al-Aqsa, within the compound of al-Aqsa and not just within its buildings. Now the city that Masjid al-Aqsa, al-Aqsa is in, it is Jerusalem, which in Arabic is called al-Quds, which means the holy And Jerusalem is one of the holiest cities in the world, not just to Muslims, but also to Jews and Christians. But for Muslims, it is considered the third holiest city in Islam, of course, after Mecca and Medina. And many prophets before Prophet Muhammad lived or worked or spent some time in Jerusalem at some point. For instance, we have prophets Ibrahim, Yaqub, and Yusuf, all of them lived in the area that we now call Jerusalem before the actual city of Jerusalem was established. That's because Jerusalem was actually established by Prophet Dawood, who was the king of the Israelites, or the ruler over the Israelites. Jerusalem was founded by Prophet Dawood, And so Prophet Dawood, of course, lived in Jerusalem, but also his son, Prophet Suleiman, also lived and ruled from Jerusalem. With that being said, we can thereby extrapolate that there are many stories in the Quran that take place in Jerusalem. For instance, Belkis, the Queen of Sheba, when she visited Prophet Suleiman, and and eventually accepted Islam. The story is explained very clearly and beautifully in the Quran. This took place in Jerusalem and almost certainly within the compound that we now call Al-Aqsa. The compound didn't exist back then, but the ground of Al-Aqsa did. And most certainly this is where Belkis came and met Prophet Suleiman and accepted Islam. 
Something else we can get from this story with Belkis, Allah describes the palace or the temple that Suleiman ruled over. This was a temple that he had constructed. Christians and Jews call it a temple. We can call it a masjid, however. This masjid was originally begun by his father, Dawood, but Suleiman alayhi salam fin finished it. This temple existed within Al-Aqsa compound, within the Al-Aqsa compound, and many believe that it is actually exactly where the Dome of the Rock now stands. After the deaths of Prophet Dawood and Prophet Suleiman, the Israelite society began to go into a period of decline, and Jerusalem passed through many different hands before eventually becoming part of the Roman Empire. During this period of time that it was part of the Roman Empire, another prophet came through, also through Jerusalem, and also at Al-Aqsa, actually a couple of prophets. Prophet Zachariah taught and preached at the temple at Al-Aqsa, and one of the students that he taught was Miriam, the mother of Isa, alayhi salam, and also Miriam as she studied under Prophet Zachariah at the temple at Al-Aqsa, the Quran mentions that she experienced many miracles and Allah discusses these miracles in the Quran. It is also at Masjid Al-Aqsa, at the compound at Al-Aqsa, where the angel visited her and informed her of the miraculous birth that she would soon have that would lead to Isa alayhi salam. This took place at Al-Aqsa. Eventually, however, this temple that was built by Prophet Dawood and Prophet Suleiman was destroyed by the Romans after a Hebrew rebellion. In the year 636 CE, the Common Era, the Muslim armies besieged Jerusalem and the Christian patriarchs of the city. They ultimately agreed to surrender, but they would only surrender to the Caliph, Omar ibn al-Khattab. We discussed this story in pretty good detail back in season two of the Islamic History Podcast. I'll discuss a little bit of it now for the historical perspective, but if you want more detail, go back to listen to uh, season two of the Islamic History Podcast. So Omar ibn Khattab, he traveled from Medina to Jerusalem to officially accept the city, officially accept, accept Jerusalem into the Muslim Empire, into the Muslim Khilafat. Once he arrived in Jerusalem, the patriarch, which is basically the Christian, the top Christian of the city, or the top Christian leader of the city, this is most likely Orthodox Christianity, not Roman Catholic Christianity. The patriarch offered to, and asked actually, he asked and requested that Omar ibn Khattab perform salat, perform prayer in the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. And the Holy Sepulcher is Christianity's holiest temple. It is their holiest site. This is where Christians believe that Isa alayhi salam, even though this goes against Islamic principles, this is where they believe that Isa alayhi salam was uh, crucified and also where he was buried and where he also returned to life. So for Christians, this is their holiest place and the patriarch. He was so impressed by Umar ibn Khattab, he wanted Umar to pray inside of the Holy Sepulcher. However, Umar declined. He declined the offer, not out of religious concern, not because he thought his prayers wouldn't be accepted for praying inside of a Christian holy place, he declined because he was concerned that later Muslims after him might use this as an excuse to take this church and turn it into a masjid. Instead, he prayed just opposite the church and a masjid was built in this location where he prayed and this masjid became known as Masjid Omar. Now, even though Masjid Omar and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, even though these two buildings are historically important, it is vital that you understand that neither one of these two buildings are part of Al-Aqsa. Neither one of them are within the compound that we know as Masjid Al-Aqsa, Al-Haram al-Sharif, the Noble Sanctuary. They're not there. They're about a quarter of a mile away. Just keep that in mind. Now, where does this name Al-Aqsa come from? Al-Aqsa means the furthest. 
It is mentioned in the Quran in the first verse of chapter 17. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Subhanalladhi asra bi abdihi laylam min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-aqsa alladhi barakna hawlahu linuriyahu min ayatina innahu huwa as-sami'u al-basir. Translation of which is Glory be to the one who took his servant, that is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, by night from the sacred masjid, that is in Mecca, the Kaaba in Mecca, to the furthest masjid, Al-Aqsa, whose surroundings we have blessed, so that we may show in so that we may show him some of our signs. Indeed, he alone, that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the all hearing, all seeing. So this proof, this proves, this verse proves that Al-Aqsa refers to the land within the compound and not necessarily to the buildings that have been constructed on the land in the compound. Because those two buildings, the two most prominent buildings that we are familiar with, Masjid Al-Qibli, which we're going to talk about in a second, which we mostly refer to as Masjid Al-Aqsa, and the Dome of the, of the Rock, Kuba to Sakhra, these two buildings were not built yet. They were not built at the time that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was still preaching in Mecca before the Hijrah. He made his um, night journey, which is what Al-Isra is, he made his night journey while he was still living in Mecca and before he made the Hijrah to Medina. So now let's talk about Masjid Al-Qibli. Masjid Al-Qibli, this is the what I would consider the more correct name for Masjid Al-Aqsa, both of them are probably good, fine, a lot of best. I don't think there's any problem with, with either one of them. I'm just concerned that many people, myself included, before I did all this research, I think many of us um, get confused that Masjid Al-Aqsa is only the building itself when it's actually the entire compound, the entire area, the entire sanctuary. So we're going to use Masjid Al-Qibli for this building that many of us we, we probably have a picture in our minds that we many, many of us consider Masjid, Al- Masjid Al-Aqsa. Anyway, Masjid Al-Qibli was the first masjid built in, in um, what we now know as Al-Aqsa. It was, it was commissioned by the second caliph, Omar ibn Khattab, in 15 AH, that is when he came to Jerusalem to accept the city from the Christian patriarchs. 15 AH roughly corresponds to 636 of the Common Era. Now, Omar ibn Khattab, he ordered for this building to be built, uh, this masjid to be built, close to where Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had made his night journey from Mecca to Jerusalem. And so this was called Masjid al-Qibli, but once again, we often call it Masjid al-Aqsa. And remember now, one thing I want to make sure we get clear here, the, um, this building is, this masjid was built in commemoration of the Prophet's night journey, al-Isra. So the, the event that we consider, al-Isra wal-Mi'raj, is really two different events. Al-Isra is the night journey, that is the Prophet miraculously traveling from Mecca, from the Kaaba to al-Aqsa. Then Al-Mi'raj is the ascension from Al-Aqsa to the heavens. And we're going to get to that in just a moment. So this masjid, Masjid Al-Qibli, that Omar ibn Khattab ordered to be built, was a very large but very simple structure. And it was designed to hold about 3,000 people. Bear in mind that Omar ibn Khattab was a very simple and straightforward man. Omar would not have been one to build a very elaborate building with domes and minarets and all that kind of stuff. If we look back at the stories of the construction of the Prophet's Masjid in Medina, and there are several hadith detailing this, it's very simple. They use palm trunks uh, from palm trees and stuff to build this first building of worship after the Kaaba, of course, to build this first building of worship in Medina. And there are hadiths about how the floor would flood when it rained and everything because it was just a very simple structure. So when Omar ibn Khattab, he got to Jerusalem, he ordered something very simple also. It was very large, but still very simple. So this first masjid that Omar had uh, 
order to be constructed, it didn't last very long. It was very simple and it didn't last that long. It was destroyed within a few decades by earthquakes. It was eventually rebuilt by Caliph Abdul Malik in 73 AH, roughly 692 of the Common Era, and eventually completed by his son Walid. This is part of the reason why I wanted to discuss Al-Aqsa during this series on the Umayyads because of the importance and the connection between the Umayyad Caliphate and Masjid Al-Aqsa. So as we mentioned, if the building was rebuilt after it was destroyed by earthquakes by Caliph Abdul Malik and then completed by his son, Caliph Walid. The masjid was renovated again during the Abbasid era by the Abbasid Caliph Al-Mansur, who reigned from 714 to 775 of the Common Era. There were further additions and and renovations to this building as time went on. It was renovated and added on to by the Abbasid Caliphs Al-Mahdi and Al-Ma'amun. And even after the Abbasids retreated from Jerusalem and Jerusalem came under the, well, Palestine actually came under the reign of the Fatimids, the Fatimids also added additional renovations. The Fatimids were a Shiite Ismaili dynasty that ruled over much of Egypt and North Africa and on into Palestine. So the Fatimids also did some renovations and added some additions on to Masjid al-Qibli. So what we have now for Masjid al-Aqsa, Masjid al-Qibli, is essentially the way it looked ever since roughly 1033 of the Common Era. The Fatimids were in charge of Palestine when the Crusaders came through and conquered Jerusalem, and the Crusaders converted Masjid al-Qibli into a church. And then it was changed from a church to a residence for the Knights Templars, the Knights of Solomon's Temples. We mentioned them in our Salahuddin series. We discussed them in depth. When Salahuddin recaptured Jerusalem, he converted, of course, this former residence for the Knights Templars back into a masjid. Salahuddin also had a membar that was specially built by his predecessor and mentor, Nuruddin Zengi. Nuruddin Zengi, he had wanted, and this is all discussed in the Salahuddin series. I won't go into too much depth. I'm hoping that if you're listening to the Umayyad series, you've heard the Salahuddin series. If not, you should go back and listen to that and get more details about this information. But Nuruddin Zengi, as he was starting to lead the Muslim revival against the Crusaders, he really was hoping to eventually take Jerusalem from the Crusaders. That honor wound up going to Salahuddin, but during Nuruddin's lifetime, in anticipation of getting Jerusalem, he had ordered the construction of a special membar, which he hoped to place inside of Masjid al-Qibli once uh, Jerusalem was taken from the Christians. Eventually, when Salahuddin wound up being the one who chased the crusaders out of Jerusalem, he brought this membar that Nuruddin Zengi had ordered constructed and placed it inside of Masjid al-Aqsa, which is Masjid al-Qibli, and it had remained there from the time of Salahuddin al-Ayyubi all the way to the 1960s. It was finally destroyed when a Christian fanatic set it on fire. After, after Salahuddin, the Ottomans also, and also some of the uh, Mamluk sultans, they added several more renovations and additions to what we now know of as uh, Masjid al-Qibli. But its basic current design and construction is roughly the same since the time of the Fatimid era. So now let's move on to the centerpiece of the show, the Dome of the Rock. It's the probably the most prominent symbol of Jerusalem ever i mean there's no others when people think of jerusalem they think of the dome of the rock um kuba to sahra now the dome of the rock is built on the highest part of uh the al-aqsa compound and it is built over the rock where prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam made the mi'raj or the ascension to heaven as we as we mentioned two different pieces to this major event there is Al Isra, which is the night journey from Mecca to Jerusalem, and that is where Masjid Al Qibli or Masjid Al Aqsa currently is. So that commemorates the Is Al Isra, the night journey, and then there is Al Mi'raj, the ascension from 
uh, Al-Aqsa to the heavens, that is where the Dome of the Rock stands. And that commemorates the Prophet's ascension to the heavens, where he communicated and com- communed with the, uh, with the previous prophets before him. The Dome of the Rock is almost certainly one of the earliest examples of Islamic architecture. The Kaaba existed before Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and so that's not really an example of Islamic architecture. Masjid al Nabawi that is no longer in its original structure. It has been expanded so many times since the Prophet's death, many, many, many times. That's an example of late era Islamic architecture. But the Dome of the Rock, Kuba to Sahra, that is probably the earliest example we have of Islamic architecture. Construction on the Dome of the Rock was begun by Abdul Malik. He wasn't caliph yet, but it was begun by Abu Abdul Malik in 66 AH and finally completed in 72 AH just before the final defeat of Ibn Zubair. Ibn Zubair, if you remember from our Ibn Zubair series, he was finally defeated in 73 AH. This goes to show that Abdul Malik was building this, uh, the Dome of the Rock while he was planning on his battle and actually fighting Ibn Zubair while the civil war was going on between the Umayyads and Ibn Zubair. There's different reasons for him building this building. Some say that he just wanted to build a dome over this rock where the prophet had made his ascension. He just wanted to, wanted to build a dome there as a shelter for the Muslims. But after he had um, hired some architects to begin the building, it just got the planning just got more and more broader and went beyond what he initially had in mind, and it became the building that it is now. Now, the Dome of the Rock, as you probably are well aware of from aerial shots and drone shots of the Masjid, there, there are many out there that exist in the world. It is a shape of an octagon with eight sides and four doors. And what is amazing, unlike Masjid al-Qibli, which has gone through several changes and several additions and several renovations, the Dome of the Rock is essentially in its same structure, the same shape with only structural structural repairs being made over all of these centuries, You're talking about almost 1400 years. That is pretty amazing. The most iconic part of the Dome of the Rock is, of course, that big golden dome, which is stationed right above the rock that the prophet ascended from. When the Crusaders came through Jerusalem and conquered it in 1099 of the Common Era, they converted the Dome of the Rock into a church. And once they took it over, they began to add Christian icons, and they also placed a gigantic gold cross on top of the dome and eventually the the uh the crusaders turned the dome of the rock into a headquarters for the knights templars during their stay during the time that the knights templars occupied jerusalem and occupied the dome of the rock and i do use that word occupied during that time that the knights templars occupy the Dome of the Rock, they did extensive exploration and excavation of the caverns beneath the masjid. And during my my episode, the episode where we discussed Freemasonry and Islam, during my research for that episode, I read many strange stories about some of the things the Knights Templars found during the excavation of the Dome of the Rock. And today, in fact, Israel is doing much of the same. And there are many concerns that Israel's continued excavation of the of the grounds beneath the Dome of the Rock are threatening the structural integrity of the Masjid. Eventually, Salahuddin, of course, as we know, freed Jerusalem from the Crusaders, and he had that cross taken down, and all of this was discussed in pretty good depth in our Salahuddin series. And again, I encourage you to go and listen to that if you have not already. After Salahuddin, many years later, eventually Jerusalem becomes part of the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Sultan, Suleiman the Magnificent, commissioned Quranic verses inscribed 
just below the dome. And these were the first six verses from the 36th chapter of the Quran, Surah Yasin. However, the remainder of the building, all the, the eight walls that make up the exterior of the building, are also decorated with more Quran verses. And these are from um, Surah Al Isra, the 17th chapter of the Quran. So Surah Yasin is just below the dome, whereas Surah Al Isra is on the walls on the exterior of the masjid. Within the masjid, within Kuba to Sakhra, within the Dome of the Rock, there are several several relics. And there are lots of stories and legends behind these relics. We'll talk about some of them, not all of them, probably too many to go through. And for all of them, Allah knows best how true these things are. I have some skepticism about them. And this is a personal thing with me. If it's not mentioned in the Quran or by Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa so all these different relics that people attribute to different things, unless there's some sort of historical evidence or proof to it, I'm a little skeptical about it. I'm not saying it's wrong or that's not true. I'm just skeptical about it myself. And so I take it with a grain of salt. For instance, within Kubutu Sakhra, within the Dome of the Rock, there is a slab of stone that is said to have been the cover of Prophet Suleiman's tomb. I don't know how true that is. Allah knows best. There's also, there is a, a, a depression that people say is the handprint of angel Jibril. Again, Allah knows best how true that is. There's another monument or relic, I should say. There's another relic that people say is the footprint of Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then there is, an, there is, of course, the well of souls. This is an interesting one. The Well of Souls is a small cave beneath the rock, actually beneath the actual rock Prophet ascended from, that is just large enough for a few people to pray there. Now, for Muslims, Muslims consider this the Well of Souls. And there's a legend, an Islamic legend, that's once again not verified by Quran or Hadith, but I'll just mention it, just putting it out there, that is called the Well of Souls because... It holds the souls of people waiting to get to heaven. I don't know about that. From the non-Muslim side, however, many Jews and many Christians believe that this well of souls, a small cavern beneath the rock, many believe that this was a site of the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies was a chamber within Solomon's temple where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. You probably know what the Ark of the Covenant is if you watch those old Indiana Jones movies, but if you don't, I'll quickly explain it. The Ark of the Covenant is suppo- was supposed to contain the slabs, the laws that Prophet Musa alayhi salam brought down from the mountain from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They contained the Torah, the, not the Torah, the Taurat. It contained the Taurat that was the law that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to Prophet Musa alayhi salam. When the Israelites went to war, they would carry these slabs inside of a gigantic pedestal that they would carry before them. I don't want to say as for good luck, but to bring Allah's blessings to them and bring his, his mercy to them when they went to war. And it will allow them to gain victory over their enemies. And so this Ark of the Covenant, once again, contained the slabs that contained, that held the law that came directly from Allah to Prophet Musa. From there, within the well of souls, within this cavern, beneath the rock, there is something interesting. There is um, a marble structure that's built into one of the walls in this cavern. And many scholars, not Islamic scholars, secular academic scholars, many scholars believe this is the first mihrab in Islam. Mihrab is the niche or the the, uh, location that signifies or symbolizes the direction of the Qibla. So if you go to pretty much any masjid in the Muslim world, there will be a, a little cutout in the front of the masjid that points towards, not really points, but it show, it, it's like a, a, a symbol. This is the direction towards the Qibla, towards, towards Mecca, towards the Kaaba. So 
This, however, this um, mihrab within the well of souls, it is a marble structure. And unlike the mihrab that we are mostly familiar with, which are concave, meaning they, they bend away from us, this mihrab is completely flat. It's still there. There are many pictures of it online. This mihrab is completely flat. And inscribed on this mihrab is the kalimatain. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And it is written in Kufic script. So many people believe that this was placed during the time of Abdul Malik. Allah knows best. Nobody's really 100% certain when it was actually put there. Some people actually believe it was much later than that. But the consensus seems to be that it was done during the time of Abdul Malik or at least the very early Umayyad Caliphate. The first concave mihrab that we are familiar with today, however, was built by Abdul Malik's son, Walid. And he built these both at the Prophet's Masjid in Medina and the, the main masjid, the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus. So that explains much of the Dome of the Rock, Kubat al The other building I want to discuss within Al-Aqsa is a structure known as the Dome of the Chain, which would be Kubat al hope I got that right. Kubat al or the Dome of the Chain, it sits just east of the Dome of the Rock, just east of the Masjid, it's not part of the master, not part of the Dome of the Rock, is outside the Dome of the Rock, just east of it. It is a small domed shelter. And I would compare it, or it's kind of like a pavilion at a park, but of course, much nicer and much more ancient. And it's not really clear when this Dome of the Chain was built, but most scholars believe it was built by the Umayyads. There is, however, some dispute as to its original purpose. So when you look at the Dome of the Chain, it's not that large. It can accommodate maybe 20 people if everybody squeezes in tight. So it's not that large. It's a dome. Like I said, it's kind of like a, like a park pavilion. It's pretty simple. There's no, it doesn't have like walls or anything else. There's no doors. It's just a dome over a shelter. And some say that it was built for the builders, the men and men who were building the Dome of the Rock, a place for them to rest at. Others say that it was constructed as an additional sheltered space for people to pray. Allah knows best which one of those was its, was its original purpose. Now, as for the name, it's not exactly clear how the Dome of the Chain got that name. There's one story that says that it's a legend, I will say. It's more of a legend than a story. That there used to be a chain suspended from heaven all the way down to where the dome of the chain is right now. During the time of Prophet Dawood and Prophet Sulaiman, alayhim was salam. And the purpose of this chain that was suspended from heaven was that if there were two people who were arguing or who had a dispute, a legal dispute, the judge, if he could not figure out who was telling the truth, he would have them give their side of the story and then try to grab this chain. The one who was lying would be unable to grab it. The chain would sway away from their hand if he tried to grab it. And so that's how they would know who was telling the truth and who was lying. And again, Allah knows best. Now, there are many other monuments and buildings within Al-Aqsa. We'll discuss a few of them. We can't go through all of them. There's so many of them, but we'll briefly discuss a few of the other buildings and monuments inside of Al-Aqsa. There is the Islamic Museum. It was established in 1923. It contains a large collection of Qur'ans, Islamic coins, and other Islamic artifacts. There's also another monument called Musalla Marwani, uh, Non-Muslims, they call this uh, place Solomon Stables, but that is completely incorrect because it was definitely built during the Umayyad Caliphate, and it was built as an underground prayer area to accommodate more people to pray in the southeast corner of Al-Aqsa. I don't know why the people of the book call it Solomon Stables. Again, Allah knows best. Another 
uh, icon or monument there is the Cradle of Isa. This is, uh, Musala Marwani is below ground. The Cradle of Isa is just above Musala Marwani and it is above ground. It is a small niche or a small depression in the ground and it is covered by a domed alcove. And it is said that this depression is where Miriam, alayhi salam, lay the baby Jesus down as she was trying to explain to her family how she, as a virgin, had a baby. Allah knows best that that's true also. But this was built during the Abbasid era, but nobody really knows by whom or why. And then there is al Burak Wall. It is known by most people, as the Wailing Wall, and Jews believe that it is the last remaining wall of the Second Temple. And throughout history, even though many Muslims, I won't say most, but many Muslims don't believe that it was the Second Temple, many Muslims believe that this was where Prophet Muhammad وسلم, tied the mystical animal known as Barak, the animal that he rode during his heavenly ascension, during al miraj this is an animal that was not quite a horse and not quite a donkey. Uh, the Hadith explained it better. I, I really don't have the information right now. To, I heard the story so many times, but 